No matter where you work, learning how to manage your time, projects, and workflows is such a key skill. I often attribute my early success in my business, Innovators Box, to have strong project management skills. And no, I'm not just talking about the PMP Project Management Professional Certifications as a way to manage projects. And yes, organization and project management skills are crucial even as an executive. Probably even more so as an executive. Learning how to manage multiple projects, deadlines, and priorities is what helps me navigate from one client project to content development to team management within the same day. So there is always room for growth. And as I reflect on how we could be better leaders, I was curious how others were honing their project management skills. Hi, welcome to Dear Workplace, where we study changes, trends, and challenges in the workplace. I'm Monica Kang, founder and CEO of Innovators Box and the host of this podcast. Some people might say it's a solution, but the fact that there are so many apps, websites, things that promise productivity in the world actually just makes it even more cloudy, right? Like, because sometimes it just adds more complexity. When we really took a moment to analyze what was working and what wasn't working, we realized we needed to cut all those other languages and just focus on Portuguese for foreigners. And that's when we found our sweet spot. The school took off. I give away books. People buy books. I get sponsors to purchase books. When I speak, I've got a whole checklist on how to move books when you're speaking. It's like 12 or, or more steps. I just go down the list. I love organizing and managing projects. But I didn't always think I was good at it. In fact, when I first learned project management as a business skill, I had mixed feelings about it. First, because I felt overwhelmed by the overly structured process I saw in processes such as the PMP. Project Management Professional Certifications. It felt like if you didn't follow the way things were done, then you were not doing a good job. And second, because I wasn't sure if this was something I was good at. Really? How would you know you were good at it? I had experienced meeting deadlines, bringing people together, and accomplishing things in a collaborative manner. But I wasn't really sure what it meant to manage projects as a skill and why that was so key. Plus, I wasn't sure how this could help me as a leader. It wasn't until I started working and became a founder that I got to appreciate this skill more and rethought about what it really means. No, you don't need PMP or master a particular system to be a good project manager. Rather, you have to be good at understanding your surroundings, your people, your projects needed to create workflows and manage how you reach your goals as you create processes that lead you and your team to succeed. And I feel it's a skill we often underappreciate and don't get to fully explore how to hone more. Which is why I was super pumped to speak with three friends navigating this in a very different way that may inspire you to rethink project management. Whether it's in one business, book marketing, or content development, each friend shares why learning how to manage projects and create processes with their teams was key to their success in navigating the ever-changing workplace and why you'd want to explore doing so too. The client asked for business license or whatever. So I was like, okay, these are the steps I need to do to make this happen. But I was in so much in survival mode and, and living out of necessity. So, and it ended up doing really well, I would say not by accident per se, but I would say like, you know, the iterations and, and maybe making the right decisions now that I look back at it. And, and also maybe luck could be it's timing, technology, it's a bunch of factors. Meet Salima Villani, founder and CEO of Ripple Impact and the author of Innovation Starts with an Eye. Salima loves optimizing and rethinking how we could do more with less. But she didn't always see herself as a project manager, nor would you see her describe herself that way. But when you take a closer look at how she manages her time, people, energy, and multiple projects, you quickly notice how she found a way to create a unique approach with her love of innovation and entrepreneurship. And it all started 
with wanting to solve her own pain point when she graduated from college into a bad market. Interestingly, I can't say it was all an accident, but let's just say that I was always just very focused on the present. And I'd say operating in survival mode really helped me innovate and build different ventures from my first crisis, which was in 2009 when I graduated from college, couldn't find a job, went to Brazil, decided to do some volunteer work, thought I was going to an orphanage to do volunteer work. I ended up helping launch a language school to finance that orphanage in Rio de Janeiro. And so I ended up having to start a school from scratch and learn how to start a business or it was a nonprofit at the time. Now it's a social enterprise. But yeah, it was very interesting. I had to learn how to be an entrepreneur on the ground as a volunteer over the course of just a few months and get a school up and running, which ultimately ended up being really successful. It was not easy, but that kind of started my whole career as both an entrepreneur as well as an entrepreneur. Tell me a bit more. What happened in Brazil? Yeah, so I was in Brazil and they were like, we need to make more money for this orphanage to operate because we need to keep our staff on longer and they're all volunteers. We need more money for the kids and for the infrastructure. And so I essentially had to get a school up and running and it was, well, first we were teaching all these different languages. I started, you know, a lot of volunteers from other countries came to help me out and we quickly started teaching a bunch of different classes in different languages. And we were trying to get Brazilians to learn Spanish, English, Dutch, Italian, German, all these different languages. And then we were also testing, well, let's also teach Portuguese to foreigners. Now that was a little more costly because we had to hire Portuguese teachers and we couldn't source our own you know, languages in ourselves. But ultimately we found that our business model started to fail because we were teaching a lot of private classes, which were supposed to be group classes, but only like one student would show up for the other languages. But Portuguese for foreigners was really interesting. A lot of students would come from you know different countries and they were very interested. And they were like, I love the social impact mission. I love, you know, we'd love to go visit the kids at the orphanage. We want to create a community. Like can we do capoeira or samba and, and hang out with you guys? And it was interesting because when we really took a moment to analyze what was working and what wasn't working, we realized we needed to cut all those other languages and just focus on Portuguese for foreigners. And that's when we found our sweet spot, the school took off and it did really, really, really well as soon as we made that decision to let, do less and do more with that less. Learning how to do more with less by understanding what is your sweet spot. This is crucial in how we organize, decide, and manage things because often we try to always do more instead of taking a step back to ask, what can we do in a system and workflow that can make this successful? When Salima realized systems and self-awareness were the keys to creating success, she continued on that discovery to create other systems like her translation business in Italy and later with her business helping entrepreneurs at Ripple Impact. My Italian wasn't great at the time. And so I struggled. And so my brother told me, well, why don't you do, you have some languages and sure your degree is in international development, but you're not going to find a job and you don't have a master's degree. And right now we're in the Greek crisis or the Euro crisis is about to start. So I ended up uh, just going online and I uh, went to elance.com and started doing some translation work, just translating whatever I could into English. And it was winning a lot of projects because at that time the gig economy was really tiny. And so not as competitive, I managed to get some translation projects. One time I got this huge translation project and it was actually from doing a big translation from Dutch to English. And I ended up doing so well on that, that that turned into English translation into many other languages, Czech, Hungarian, Swedish, Danish, Italian, French, Spanish, etc. And I was like, well, what am I going to do? I don't speak all those languages, but they want my help. And I'm like, I don't even know anything about a translation agency or a Trados or any of these softwares. It was all human. It was all me. And I was like, okay, well, how about we start hiring us? My, my partner at the time came on board and he was like, well, there's potential here. Let's incorporate this thing and let's source other translators. And quickly we started to source other translators. And um, I think now that I look back, I realized that I was very good at sending really good proposals out. And it was again, following the 80-20 rule, mastering eventually had a really good proposal template, customizing it, really listening to what the client wanted. I was also sleeping with my laptop under my pillow when I was living in Italy wake up during the night random times and wanted to be the first person to apply to any new job that came up. And yeah, ultimately it went really well and business, it took off. And for a few years, it, it was doing well until I would say Google started to slowly automatically translate websites because our, our niche was in you know, website translation, especially as well as some other areas. But especially at the time we could do stuff in HTML, 
there were not a lot of our agencies that could do that at the price we were doing it at. And also we didn't have any overhead being all work from home. Yeah, we were sourcing from the gig economy. So it did well until we realized that Google was going to replace us. And at that point, we sold the business and, and then we did it right on time before Google entirely replaced and started using AI to do it all. So many gems of insights. Yes, while what we learn first about managing projects and workflows may be out of necessity, the key is what we do with that knowledge. Did you catch the nuances in what Salima shared and how diligent she was? She was willing to wake up early every day to be the first to respond to projects. And she could do so because she had the 80-20 templates that she systemized, as well as the workflow within her teams. This led them to not only win more projects, but systematically be ready to deliver the result and quality others wanted. So no, you don't need just a PMP structured project management tool to manage your projects and businesses to success. You want to rethink it by starting with what you can and cannot do and systemize. But that's not the only thing that's crucial. Dr. Bob Nelson, the leading expert in employee recognition and engagement, speaks about how his determination and diligence are what helped him write 30 plus books that sold multi million copies. He wrote a lot of books about the workplace, including dummies on recognizing and engaging employees, and his latest book, Being Work Made Fun, Gets Done, which drives into the importance of fun and play at work. A topic, as you can probably predict, I loved seeing. As an early stage author myself, I was so intrigued. Dr. Bob, how do you not only make the time to write, but market and share your books with the world? His answer? Have a list you continue to go back to. In other words, have a system process to manage your book's success. You've got to be the book wherever you go. So you, I carry books with me. Uh, no matter what, my wife laughs because I'll, I'll have a suitcase and a carry-on. They're both completely filled with books with one spare change of underwear stuffed in the side. <laughs> and uh, that's how I roll. I, um, I give away books. People buy books. I get sponsors to purchase books. When I speak, I've got a whole checklist on how to move books when you're speaking. It's like 12 or, or more steps. And I just go down the list. So here I'm doing a keynote speech for a state conference, and uh, I've got a whole checklist. I just go down the list. I go, great, I'm really excited to be speaking on the XYZ group on my latest book, Domain Re, and, and um, a lot of times people would like to get a copy of the book, and would you like to buy books for all the attendees of your conference? Ha, yeah, we're giving you all the money. We don't have anything left. They go, okay, okay, no problem. Is it okay if I found someone else that would buy books for all your attendees. What? Who would do that? Well, <laughs> let's talk about it because I, I could do it or I could show you how to do it. And then, or, or we could both try and see who's successful. I do that. And if they say no to that, I'll keep going. And I'll say, okay, okay. So you don't want to buy books and you don't want a sponsor to buy books for your conference. That's right. We get all the sponsors. Uh, okay. I understand. Great. Can you do me a favor? People expect the author to have their book. And I want to bring some books there, but I don't want to bring 10 boxes of books, which are heavy, by the way, and then have to send back nine. Now I'm losing money on every book. On your conference registration, could you add a little box for people to check if they would like to have a discounted copy, signed copy of the keynote's latest book? And, and no obligation, no money. I just want to know how many to bring. And so... First time I did that, it was the conference had 600 people, 500 of them checked the box. And then, of course, I brought more than that because people would come up and say, hey, can I get 10 copies? Yes, you can. And, so, and if that didn't work, I just keep going down the list. Now, at a glance, what Dr. Bob shares may not look like project management. A list of things to do to accomplish a goal. How is that similar to me managing a project with multiple stakeholders, deadlines, and changing situations? Yes, but what's described here is Dr. Bob's process that he cultivated over time to find a way to accomplish his goal of selling more books. His system is having a list and not taking no for an answer. 
He is using past knowledge and experience to develop different methodologies and communicate in a timely manner so that he could work with clients on these different approaches. As you could envision, if he suggested the check the box idea a few weeks before the event, it wouldn't have worked. And then he wouldn't be able to pack enough books for the event. I was blown away by how systematic and intentional he was in this approach. Yes, he really did not take no for an answer. And that determination is what helped him be the author and speaker he is today. He is meticulous. For instance, he shares how he made the intention of visiting as many bookstores as he could, which led him to visiting 500 plus bookstores. I don't think I've been to that many, even as a visitor. And it made me really think about how he thinks about his book marketing process. The first year that book came out, I personally visited 500 bookstores. 500 bookstores all over the country. In my travels and speaking and promotions, hey, a lot of times you do a media tour, you've got an escort and I get to the next place and I go, okay, okay, we're, we're done for the morning. Am I get some lunch? I'd say, lunch? Let's go to some bookstores. <laughs> I remember an escort I had in Chicago. The guy said, I've been doing this for 27 years. I have never, ever seen someone pound the pavement like you do. I go, really? What do most authors do? Well, they go, oh, take me back to the hotel. I'm going to take a nap. Or some say, I'm done with this stuff. Take me to the airport <laughs> and, and just blow off the rest of their. I go, I can't imagine. I cannot imagine. Why would you spend your so much effort to create the thing and, and then be too lazy to get the word out or they have the expectation that people will find you? You know, you can have the best book in the world. If they haven't heard of it, no one's going to be able to find it and use it. So. I remember in <laughs> in New York City, I was staying across from Madison Square Garden in a, kind of a seedy area at the time, and time to go home. And I, and in my hotel room, they used to have yellow pages, and I, I looked it up and found bookstores, and I, I ripped the whole section out of the book, and I went out to a cab, and, and I said, "Take me to these stores." And as I was in one store, you take me to the next one, and I end of the day took me to. JFK and I caught a flight home. I, I hit uh, 27 stores in, in Manhattan and loved every minute of it. And, and a lot of times I say, well, do you want to go to a store where you, we don't know if they're carrying your book. They don't want to take an author there and the book's not there, then they're embarrassed. I go, no, 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 do not call them before I come. You know, I want to show up. You know? And then if they don't have the book, I'll say, oh, that's too bad. I, I could have signed them for you, you know? And then they're going to take out their order sheet and you know, immediately order some. That, I've seen them do it, you know? And, and, and by the way, less than a year later, I was back with that same book, speaking in Madison Square Garden, across from where I stayed that day I drove around town. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, indeed. And if you're thinking, but I don't have a book or a business, I'm thinking about project management from an everyday project at a work point of view. Let me bring you to why Jerry Wan shares why this is so crucial in how you work every day. Jerry Wan is the founder and CEO of Just Like Media, where he celebrates Asian American storytelling through creative content like podcasts. Through his work at Just Like Media and also as a consultant, where he provides keynote speaking services on storytelling, diversity, equity, and inclusion, he realized how crucial it is to create projects with the process in mind. Because the reason to why some projects we manage falls behind is that some of them don't have a deadline or have someone looking over us. We have to take ownership in how we set deadlines and project workflows to want to make it better. I appreciated Jerry's humility in saying that, hey, it's okay to know if this isn't our top strength, but we must be intentional in how we think about this to make what we do more impactful and effective across the teams and people we work with. Yes, I'm pretty bad at it. I think there exists a huge gap in not just for me, but for so many people, how they view themselves in productivity, busyness and success versus how other people view them. And then there's the third of what actually is reality. What I probably could get better at is to hire help whether it is through assistants or partners or something like that, to build procedures and to make sure that things are not falling through the crack. So 
for example, I am every like funnel or like roadblock from an episode of the Asian Americans getting uploaded with the exception of like our editor. Actually, I'm like behind two weeks right now as we speak. And the challenging thing is if you were to miss a deadline at work, you'd know in a minute, right? In this world, nobody really cares, right? So a fan or a friend might be like, hey, I noticed, you know, you haven't uploaded in a few weeks. Like, are you okay? Cool. But like, it's not the end of the world. And so discipline, you can build discipline through building systems and checks and balances. Obviously, if somebody's paying you for the work, you're going to do it on time. But in a season or in a phase where it's just literally a passion project or you're just in between projects, like that's the toughest thing. And I think some people might say it's a solution, but the fact that there are so many apps, websites, things that promise productivity in the world actually just makes it even more cloudy, right? Like, because sometimes it just adds more complexity. But I would establish at the very minimum a workflow of who does what, at what point. We use some productivity tools, so it's not to say that we don't. There will come to a point where if you start your own thing, that you, you will hit a ceiling of some sort where your time is so valuable or it hits and you need to bring in other people. And so one of the biggest challenges as a solo entrepreneur is deciding what to invest money in because otherwise you get to keep it, right? And so client pays you $10, you don't get to keep all of it. You want to, you need to invest in your business a little bit, but it's a matter of, I would like the money for my own personal life living and building versus I need to invest in something. And I think that's the toughest part. And I don't, I don't have any full-time employees under my care. So, you know, how you build that to make sense for you, I, I think is really, really challenging. With all that being said, at least for the first chapter or two of you, whoever wants to start something, you actually have to put in so much work that nobody's ever going to see. Because it's a lot of work and it's ungrateful work and it's grunt work and it's crappy, but people only judge you by what they see. I always think it's funny. People always give me kudos like, oh, you've built this thing and yada, yada, yada. I'm like, cool. But like in between my own head, that's not the way I think about it. And so, you know, you, you got to be willing to put on the work and surround yourself with people who are going to be supportive of that. Yeah. So many nuggets of wisdom right here. At times, we feel using standard processes or productivity tools helps us manage projects. But what's even more crucial is having that clear roadmap of how we see the workflow. This is why for us, whether it's a podcast, client engagement, or product launch, it's crucial we have multiple project workflow that has a clear guide on who is doing what, but also where we account for flexibility and change. This way, everyone is empowered to step in and also ask for help if they need support. And to create a system that works, I need to dig deeper into what I need, what my team needs, and think about the whole journey from everyone's point of view. Then the good system helps us make the project successful. You learn to see things from the operation point of view, which is really fun. I sure enjoyed being able to geek out and learn how others are rethinking system and project management in their own fields. And I hope this inspired and empowered you today too. Thank you, Jerry, Salima, and Dr. Bob for joining our show to share your stories and journey as an innovator. And thank you all for joining us at Dear Workplace to reflect on how we work better together. This is your host, Monica Kang, founder and CEO of Innovators Box. And wow, I can't believe how fast time has flown by. It's already Christmas at the end of this week, and next week is our final Dear Workplace episode of 2021. So yes, Season two will continue on in January with some stories, and I hope you'll continue to join us to reflect and reimagine how we thrive at work better together. Building on these insights, we'll next dive into how we rethink about team development at work. What does that mean? Join us next week at Dear Workplace to uncover more. Send any questions at info at innovatorsbox.com or at dearworkplace.com. Yes, we just released our holiday album, Pause to Wonder, by Innovators Box Studios, and we hope you'll love it too. Tune into any music streaming platforms. Have a great week and Merry Christmas, Innovators. See you soon.
I pause to wonder. Hello there, I'm Luke Helder, the head composer here at Innovators Box, and I hope you're enjoying Dear Workplace. Did you know that music helps plants grow faster? This show is brought together by our awesome team, Sam Lermont on audio engineering and editing, Kelly Grave on marketing, Akriti Pandey on website design, Monica Escobar on branding, Leah Orsini on social media graphics, Sarah Piedraita and Floor on project assistance, and me on music. And of course, Dear Workplace is hosted and directed by Monica Kang, founder and CEO of Innovators Box. To continue the conversation of reimagining the workplace, visit us at innovatorsbox.com. Also, don't forget to subscribe, leave a review and share. We would love to hear what you enjoy and what I can convince Monica to talk about in our next episodes. See you next week.